brought to us uh, this European legal perspective, which is really great to have here. Um, and I don't recall the title that you gave for the talk, but uh, we'll be speaking about privacy is the protection of the incomplete self. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Whoa, so um, I changed the title and also tweaked the, the subject because, in the, because you put me at the back of the session. Uh, that made it possible for me to see what this audience <coughs> might be able to um, uh, relate to. And I thought this is much more uh, interesting for you also because you're basically interested in uh, differential privacy. I had taken the beyond uh, a bit too far, I think. I was going to talk about what happens when in law you move from text-driven law, which is what we now have, to data-driven and code-driven law. And for those people who especially came for that topic, I did add two slides at uh, the back. So um, actually, I want to start with this. Uh, this is uh, what is called a brain teaser. Why am I putting this brain teaser all up front, apart from amusing you? Uh, it is a point I want to make, and that point is, that it shows that perception and cognition um, in the, the, the rise of a person, of a, of a human subject, come second. What comes first is interacting with an environment. Here you see that because the brain knows that human faces have two eyes and one mouth, when it gets to see this picture, it is just calibrating until this becomes a normal human face. Because it's getting other signals that doesn't work. So you basically want me to remove this picture as soon as possible because your brain doesn't like it. We are used to think that first you observe something, you look at something, you understand it, and then you act. That is what we have learned. That's an accomplishment, I think. And it's, it has a lot to do with our um, ability to speak in natural language. It's the result of that. But before we come down to that, and when you look at other organisms, from amoebas <coughs> to cat, etc., there is this interaction with the environment that basically determines what you are going to see, of course, depending on your biological makeup. So I want to talk about privacy as the protection of the incomputable self. Uh, when we went out hiking, we were asked to put up uh, a topic for discussion. I put up this question because after the end of the second day, I thought, oh, OK, there seems to be a presumption here that privacy is something that you can completely compute. Um, I think that's a, f that's a fundamentally flawed assumption. And because it is flawed, it's also dangerous. Because if you assume that, you are producing blind spots and the agility of your mind. And if anybody has agile minds, I believe from my own experience, it's computer scientists, you're basically limiting, constraining that agility. Uh, I had said that uh, I would take a hike towards the music cafe bookshop on Bancroft. And when I just arrived for the first time, or sorry, on Sunday or something here, I went to this place because I love it when I was here before. Uh, and they had this, it wasn't really stale, but it certainly wasn't fresh. And I loved the poetry of the way to sell it. So I'm going back to this. I already pointed this out when I gave my uh, unbaked ideas. So when you talk about things that are countable or that are made countable, uh, making something countable, uh, the fact that you can count it doesn't mean that it counts in the sense of that it matters. So not everything that is countable counts. Not everything that counts is countable. And I think this insight is core to my presentation. So if this is what you don't agree with, I'm very curious, but it might be that you will disagree with the entire presentation. I think this um, statement can also bridge between computer scientists and lawyers, and, that's, and, and maybe others, but let's, let's speak about law and computer science. So there's a paper underlying this uh, uh, where uh, many of the things that I will only touch on are further discussed. 
I want to talk briefly about differential privacy, and I will say that what makes differential privacy interesting and um, salient and functional is that actually it's saying that the individual doesn't matter because you are creating databases, you're creating an aggregate, and you can remove somebody from that aggregate and basically it's still saying the same thing. Then you're inferring patterns from that aggregate in such a way that an individual doesn't matter. So in a way that that thing, that uh, mechanism, differential privacy, says individuals don't matter. That's interesting to remember. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, as long as it is a tool to do something good. Uh, then I will talk about privacy as the protection of the incomputable self. I will conclude from that that the fact, and this is the main argument of the paper, the fact that things are not computable means that they are computable in different ways. So many people will say, you know, let's say the romantic part of humanity will say, oh, but things are not really computable, they're very deep and it's all about feeling. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's interesting, yeah? But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is if you do, if you make something computable, that is an act. And you can always do that in different ways, depending on your assumptions and on the goal of making things computable. So the best thing you can ever do is make the same thing computable in different ways because it will give you the black, uh, the black spots. Hmm? Like when you're driving a car and there's this one spot you don't see. So this is the main argument and that will evolve towards an argument for agonistic machine learning which means when you start developing a machine learning research design, you should get in domain experts. That hopefully always happens, that's normal. But you should also get in the people that are going to be affected by the application as soon as possible. That will cover better your blind spots. It will inform how you make trade-offs. There's no machine learning research design that does not involve all kinds of trade-offs. So the question is not, to develop a machine learning research design that has no trade-offs. Whoever claims that is bullying you. I'm very curious about your response to this uh, provocative statement. Whoever claims that is bullying is trying to intimidate. No, you can always find trade-offs. And what is important is to put them on the table. And then to say what are the implications of these trade-offs. <coughs> and then to make it practical and say, okay, we think this machine learning application is good. We want AI for good and all that deeply ethical stuff. Um, so let's bring in the right people and sit down and decide what trade-offs are acceptable. And that's, of course, also a distribution of risks. And uh, if there is time, I will say something about uh, the other subjects. So, briefly, about differential privacy, as I have understood, it does... Oh, yes, what's very important, I believe that whatever technology is introduced into society... So, this is not about developing new mathematical models. This is about once you take them out of the lab, out of the academia, into society. You must always ask three questions, and after that you can do your risk-benefit uh, analysis, etc., cost-benefit and risk analysis. But these questions come first. Which problem are you solving? Okay, which problems are you not solving? Maybe the problems that you're not solving are the real problems. Third question, what problem are you creating? When you introduce new technologies, they will create problems. And after you've carefully looked at this, you can go ahead or not. Now, what I understand, the problem that differential privacy solves is it reduces the risks of detecting personal data in aggregate data, one and two. It enables you to obtain statistical research, sorry, research results while protecting against re-identification. That's what I see are uh, the problems that are solved. And that's important. Um, and well, let, let's come back to that. What problem is not solved? Yes. Well, don't agree that that's what uh, differential privacy gives. It gives 
much more. It gives that, uh, for instance, if uh, your information is in a database and your insurance rate won't change very much, so it gives mu much stronger protection. Yeah, yeah. So, Th this is a narrow yeah, so this is differential privacy. So this is a qualification. This actually relates what I said earlier. It doesn't only do this, but it does it in a way that doesn't diminish the value of the set, of the aggregate data, and of the model, right? Yeah, that, that's a very important qualification. Yeah. So the problem with making slides. Let me try to explain what Amos was trying to say. These two sentences don't uh, uh, don't match with differential privacy. This is like a small part of what differential privacy is doing. But in I'm talking about the problem that it's solved. In eh? terms of protection, okay? And the problem that it solves is much wider than what is written now in, in your slide. So what is the wider? In particular, what Amos was referring to is that it can provide uh, guarantees on, on, on harms, yeah. on risks that are not uh, uh, shown here, that it provides... Uh, Which harms are not shown here? No harms are shown here. Like, well, this does not yeah, yeah. speak about my okay, but insurance. Then I, yeah. About my insurance. <laughs> so, okay. But differential privacy has a succinct way to, to deal with privacy harms, with risks, uh, and this is not represented here. And also, differential privacy gives tools, uh, gives protection when we have multiple uh, analysis that are running, which is also not... Uh, okay, so I would need like 16 slides to explain more precisely what differential privacy is. Um, I uh, agreed, and you know that better than me. And but I, I want to make a presentation that goes beyond differential privacy, so if I have to do the whole presentation on differential privacy, I will not get beyond. So I want to I think move it's, on. It's important to present it fairly. I'm not talking about. Yes. Okay. Not to talk about differential privacy. Okay. Yeah. It's important to uh, yeah. present it fairly yeah. Yeah. and saying that differentially, differential privacy that things that people don't matter or things like that. This is not a fair representation okay. of the technology. So, okay, but I'm not going to now at this moment make a new slide presentation, right? So you're saying this is not fair. That's very interesting uh, in relation to discussions about machine learning, fairness, etc. So I'm point taken, um, and and I move on, and uh, let let's see. So let's move to the problems that it does not solve. Hmm? What it doesn't solve is the manipulability, not the manipulation. I'm not interested in manipulation. I'm interested in manipulability, so the extent to which these systems, machine learning applications, not mathematical models, machine learning applications, are capable of preempting behavior by way of nudging, etc. Now, you could say that, and correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> that differential privacy is about the construction of aggregate data, the construction of inferences from that aggregate data. That's where it is focused on. Where I think are very important problems, and at this moment I even think the most important problems, is what happens after you have the inferences. How these inferences are capable of manipulating people. That problem is not addressed and so not solved by differential privacy. Um, but what like, problems? Okay. I would like to push back on this. I, I oh. totally agree with the first sentence in this here, but the second one is completely wrong because no um, machine learning technique, regardless whether it cares about individuals or not, okay, regardless whether individuals make a difference or not in that technique, no, none of these techniques helps pr uh, protecting the first bullet. So I don't think this is related to the fact that differential uh, privacy has this requirement that the outcome would not depend on an individual. Coffee makers yeah. also don't exactly. like, solve the manipulability problem, but that's yeah. because they're like not. Yeah. But just so, because it, it applies to lots of technology doesn't mean it doesn't apply to this one. I mean, no, no, but it's a vacuous <laughs> statement. It applies <laughs> to everything. There's sort of this effort to set up a straw yeah. man here that yeah. is like, 
that, okay. I think that's what Kobe is picking. Yeah. Okay. So I think when I realized when the the uh, in the first day, I think, or the first and the second day, when there was an explanation about what differential privacy actually does, that it means that you're basically telling somebody if we not just this person, but whoever wants to use the application, I'm not talking about math, whoever wants to use the application, that you can safely withdraw people from it and still have the same value knowledge in the aggregate and still have the same valid inferences. That's the whole point, yeah. as far as I understand. That means that you are developing a technology I'm not talking about the math, but about the applications, because I'm a lawyer and I'm here for the people that get stuck with the applications. Yeah? So I have no problem with the math. I wouldn't even dare to say anything <coughs> about it, because this, um, you know much better. But you're developing a technology that claims, mathematically, that one person in that set doesn't matter. In that sense, I'm not saying anything very special, right? That's the, the fundamental idea of differential privacy. I don't see anywhere where differential privacy say that persons don't matter. This is not a mathematical concept. I don't ah, think very good. Yeah. that this could yeah. be... Uh, uh, but from a mathematical perspective, you agree, right? That this is what differential privacy I does. Don't, no, I don't see how <coughs> math talks about people and says that they matter or don't matter. So yeah, but, I don't have a way to agree But this is what you were telling me the first two days. So no, if I it's not true, I'm, I'm sorry, I then I misunderstood. The language here says the individual doesn't make a difference. So whether they're in or out of the set... No, but, but in the previous slide it, it was. So yeah. I, think yeah. I, I think you could you could say that individuals don't matter to the law in the same way. No, no, no. Individuals don't matter text text here. That's what I'm like talking in, about. I'm, yeah. What I'm yeah. saying is that like, I, it's a, there's just like a basic linguistic mismatch going on. But I, okay, yeah, okay, but let's, it, yeah. yeah. It might differ from language. I mean, like, yeah. a fair thing to say is that differential privacy guarantees that an individual doesn't substantially matter to the yeah. output distribution. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's not yeah. a fact. Yeah. I, I, what does it mean it doesn't matter? Of course individuals matter to us. This is why we, we exactly. devise this. Exactly, exactly. That's totally, so that's totally clear. That's totally clear. So that is, so that is on the, under the problem that it solves. It's a, it's a technique that by, by assuming that it is possible to develop the system in such a way that the, the individual entity data of a particular person do not make a difference for the aggregate and do not make a difference for the inferences, by doing this, you achieve this. <coughs> okay, I, I take it that some people are not going to agree with that. Third, what problems are created here? Well, I think that one of the problems that, is, uh, that may occur, and this is not ever the fault of mathematicians, uh, the, the, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the development of these models. But if this becomes implemented, then you're basically legitimizing the building of huge aggregates. Because you will say, well, this is, we're protecting the individuals. And you're legitimizing the inferences that are drawn from it. Because you're saying two things. We're protecting the individual one. Two, we're getting the same quality of knowledge as if we didn't do that. Yeah? This legitimization might mean that this sort of inferences are going to be used to target people, to nudge people, <coughs> to preempt people, to change the choice architecture of people. I'm not saying that that is because of your mathematical model. I'm saying that that is because that is how it's going to be employed. And I have a problem with the targeting. I have a problem. So if you make the, pro the targeting more accurate, you might not increase utility for society, but you might decrease utility for society because you're doing something very dangerous. And people will say, it's certified, it's differentially private, so it's no problem. Because as we know, there is an incentive structure where some people 
will use this argument which safeguards this part of the process to do something nasty or maybe they think it's great with that part of the process. Now this analysis is necessary and I'm not saying differential privacy is wrong, but if you do not accept that this is the consequence of what you're producing, then you can't, it's very important to realize that because then you can begin to anticipate that people might use it that way. Yeah. And you can put a disclaimer out and say, look, it is solving this problem, but it's not solving that problem. And we're not sure uh, how to deal with that problem. I just want to say, I mean, I think this is also a problem of data protection law. Yeah. I, I don't think it's just a problem of differential privacy, because I think in part differential, right, if we were focused on surveillance rather than data protection, we Which for some people is the same, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I, but I never use the term surveillance, by the way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think it is the same. And I think, um, you know, but I, I, like, I agree with everything you've said, mm -hmm. right? But I also think that it is not just a problem of differential privacy. I think differential privacy is in part responding to the way in which we focus concerns through a legal lens that has been focused on data yep. protection rather than surveillance. Yeah, I, I agree, um, though. I wouldn't agree for the GDPR, but I agree with the data privacy focus on hiding data. I, I've always, when I came to this field... Hiding, controlling... Yeah. You know. yeah. And I, there I totally agree. I've put in some slides on the GDPR to argue that the GDPR goes further into that, but I certainly do not believe that the GDPR is going to solve all the problems in the world. I think it goes further, but I think it still does focus more on data protection than on the manipulation issues that you're concerned with. Right? We're all concerned. Yeah, and I think that competition law, there are many <coughs> other things that are absolutely necessary for that. Yeah. So can you explain how differential privacy created profiling and micro-targeting? Hasn't these things happened before differential yeah. privacy? So you're legitimizing it by giving it a stamp that it's privacy friendly. How does a, a mathematical... But I'm uh, saying you, and I shouldn't say that, because I'm not saying that you are doing this, but if no, this but gets applied... But you said that it applied. created this problem. I can read in, in this bullet what problems yeah. does it create, and the problem is profiling and micro-targeting. Okay, so maybe it's important to differentiate between a mathematician that is developing a model to protect personal data and a market at which the results of that uh, in the form of an application is going to be used in real-world situations. I understand I'm that, interested but here. how can you blame differential privacy for profiling and micro-targeting? These are things that happened years before differential yes. privacy existed. And how did it create it? So, so you know, differential if, privacy if you, is... If you listen to what she said at the beginning, she said, is the deployment the instantiation of this uh, concept within a technological, pro within an application and a product. So you're focused and are getting very upset that it says differential privacy in the slide, and maybe that's a you know, problem with the graphic design of the slide, when it should say the use of differential privacy within a commercial product that is deployed by an actor who is not the people in this room. And, and legitimates. It, it doesn't create it. Legitimate. Well, I would, I, hold on. I would, I would not say illegitimate, yeah. but I think from like the way I listen to the practitioners, and, and this resonates with me, what you say, is that a lot of people who don't know what this technology is feel like it's solving these problems. And I think what uh, you point out is that feeling, that, that, that incorrect <coughs> feeling that it could solve these problems is something worth making salient because it doesn't and i've heard all of you say that this semester that that it you know we, we can't protect the groups we can't this is not a technique that helps with this it's not designed for that and that's okay and i think all you're doing is yeah. highlighting that right? yeah, I, I, mean, I can understand with the content but i think the presentation is also very important when you present things this way this is a way to kill a, a, a concept because you're blaming a lot of stuff on this concept even if it's just graphically, whereas if but you maybe, just want to yeah. say that this is a problem of the education system, but people have not been educated to read math and understand and be critical, that's a different thing. But maybe if I don't do it that way, maybe then the product gets sold and people don't realize it, 
and, and then you're not educating people properly. If you want to sell the idea, not even the application, but the idea of differential privacy, you have to tell people this, otherwise you're not ethically, professionally educating if people you, if properly. If you look at our papers, we tell this very Love your papers. The That's papers. not a problem. Yeah. The papers are there. I mean, sure. I, I don't know exactly but why we have to you translate. are blaming a concept for... for I'm not totally blaming a concept. I'm saying it does good this things... This is why you see on the slide. That are thing no, it does good things, it does things... Um, it, it doesn't solve everything and in the world, and, and it creates new problems. Years. The problem of legitimization, and that's huge. That's a huge problem. And I'm sure that this is not ever what you want, right? This is not your intent. But you have to take into account that that's how it might go into the world. And that's very important because it might, it might do this then, and that's precisely what you don't want to do. Omar? Um, moving back to um, content, um, so I wonder if um, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Yeah. And um, uh, tell me if that's bad. That's so there are two groups of individuals. Yeah. There is the group of individuals that, it, that is in the data set on which you're running your machine learning algorithms and you train a model. Differential privacy talks about the privacy of these individuals. Mm -hmm. But then the model itself then goes into the world and has access to new uh, data. And the question is the information, the, privacy or other concerns of the individuals that are outside of the data set that you're trying to. We're saying French privacy talks about the privacy of people inside the data set and people may interpret it as saying that whatever is the result here would also provide a, a privacy elsewhere because it doesn't... Okay, so what I'm saying is there are two things. You, want, you may want to hide identifiable data. That's, that's one problem that can be solved in part by differential privacy. But there's another problem, and that is micro-targeting. So you have uh, an inference which says people which share these five data points in 67% of the cases, they're going to buy your product or vote on this party or whatever. I think that has nothing to do with differential privacy. And what I'm saying is it's very important to acknowledge that. But my concern here is that by saying we're going to do the aggregate data and the inferences in a way that protects the privacy of the uh, people that, uh, whose data were used in the construction, uh, that this might create a legitimization here. And and that's all, I'm not blaming anybody or blaming concepts, that's not my job. I want this on the table and I think it's... The sooner the community who is developing this tool acknowledges that and builds in walls to prevent that, the better. Because you're actually the only people who can really do that. If you leave it to others, people might say, oh, it's not good. But if you do it because you know how it can save people from being re-identified um, and all the privacy harms that, um, that are mentioned that I couldn't all fit under that, what problems does it solve? So, so you, for you, it's very important to take this on. Yeah. Okay, so, so we have a technology that I, is not designed to protect against learning statistical yeah. properties of the population, great. You're concerned about learning statistical properties of population. You find some applications of, of this disturbing. Yeah. And so I think what would be productive here is maybe to try to understand when is it problematic to learn statistical properties of a population okay. and when Absolutely. is it not problematic. Yeah. And is there any way to systematize and formalize okay. that yeah. so that we can address that question? Yes, yes. And there is much out there. Now, I'm not a formalization person, so I'm not going to tell well, you how to do that. You, you yeah? do that but it, but I want to go on with the next slides because uh, I'm not going to explain to you how to do differential privacy because you know that much better. Yeah. Maybe it's good to just move on and say, um, the differential privacy as an idea, and once it is applied into technologies, into, uh, I would hope, at the moment when you build a system, a, a machine learning 
uh, computing system. So we call that privacy by design instead of privacy um, enhancing technology. So not as an add-on, but at the moment when you build the system. Well, there are many other tools like homomorphic encryption, safe answer, open private data, safe uh, technologies of Pentland. I'm not at all a fan of that, but I know it's out there. Uh, in, at Rothbard, uh, my colleagues developed polymorphic encryption and pseudonymization for confidential data like medical data, student data, very interesting technology. It does other things. And then there is the technology of attribute-based credentials against very interesting, it does other things. So um, differential privacy protects personal data, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it protects a person. And that's obvious. It's like saying it doesn't pr protect a cat from falling from the roof, right? Yes, so that's what I mean. That's all I mean. Um, now, what is very important here, and I've already announced it, uh, Privacy is not computable. But that means it can be computed in many different ways. And by using... <coughs> what do you mean by the word computable? Okay, I'm going to come to that. Yeah, I'm going to come to that. So, computability can be used in two senses. And of course, I'm playing with that, right? In the first part of the sentence, I use it in another sense in the second part. In the first part, I'm saying... Anybody who claims that they can formalize privacy completely is doing something dangerous and intimidating. It's not possible. There are very many different concepts of privacy, and the concepts depend on the environment, on the relationship between the agent whose privacy you want to protect and that environment, etc., etc. So, computability in that. It's not. It's not computable to say it's. Uh, you cannot define it, but you as a lawyer cannot define it. It's not a problem. Exactly. <laughs> but you as a computer scientist also cannot define it. We're talking about privacy. Uh, the problem is uh, it's an overloaded... Uh, sure. But it's also a real thing that aims to protect people, and you have to take that serious. Huh? I'm so, saying, yeah, okay, it's not very good. Of computability. Okay, <coughs> good. Of, I'll, uh, come, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. So... Um, Yeah, so my position, and I've worked on this for uh, 17 years now, that the biggest challenge of the fact that the self, as you see, I'm moving from privacy to the self, because privacy about protecting the self is incomputable, is not in re-identification of personal data in aggregated data or models, but the bigger challenge, I believe, is in the application of the models that have been inferred. Especially because it is very difficult for people to anticipate how these models are applied to them. I'm not telling you anything new. You know that. You've seen it. We all know that we care very much about this. I'm not trying to say that differential privacy is not important. I'm not saying anything like that. But this workshop was supposed to be about beyond, so I'm trying to look beyond. Can I just ask a clarification question? So with this last statement, you're, you're making a value statement that in your perception and the research you've done, you came to the conclusion that the, the bigger fear people have... No, no, th this is my well, concern. The bigger, bigger concern yeah, my is concern. The, the, the algorithmic decision-making rather than finding something out about an individual, like the actual values. Well, personal data, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is my concern. I'm not saying that this is what 51% uh, of the population, I'm not interested in averages. I'm trying to protect people from a constitutional fundamental rights perspective, mm -hmm. uh, not from a mathematical perspective, of course. Uh, but this is, I think, the bigger concern. Um, and. Uh, Evidently, one can disagree about that. Some people think hiding personal data is the most important concern ever. I think uh, that distracts attention from the manipulability that is created with the inferred knowledge. But I'm not saying that it is not important. Yeah, so, so 
Okay. Just one minor word issue. Yeah. Right, so what does preemption mean in this context? Ah. So preemption means that you are predicting that somebody is going to uh, stop eating meat because you've inferred that from uh, their online surf behavior. So you guess they're going to be, uh, they might be, let's say there's a chance of 83% that they will be vegetarian. Uh, this knowledge, this predictive knowledge, knowledge between inverted commas, of course, uh, can be sold to the meat industry who might have access to particular types of nudging machine learning applications that allow to send me, for instance, three scientific papers, because they will know I'm a, a scientist, an academic, they will somehow send me three academic papers that show that eating meat is extremely healthy, that you actually get, that's good for your brains. Yeah, I'm not aware that this is done because somebody has inferred that I might switch to being a vegetarian. I'm not aware of that. Mm -hmm. And then I think that I'm fully autonomously deciding, because I've seen these papers, to continue eating meat. That is what I mean with manipulability and with preemption. So before I actually move on to do something, my environment, my choice architecture, the information I get is changed in such a way that the prediction is that the chance that I become a vegetarian is now not, what did I say, 63, but 43%, because that's what we're talking about. That's what I mean with preemption. So it's like, the, it's the manipulability that I refer to. Um, because there was some confusion, I think, about the GDPR, I thought it would be a very good idea to put in some slides of the GDPR, but I'm going to keep it very short because um, we probably already have to skip part of the presentation, which is perfectly fine by me because this is a conversation, this is not a lecture, right? But I do want to do that, and I also want to, to tell you that I've taught a lot to computer scientists, master students of computer science, for eight years, and um, this has been a pleasure. I always say it was party time. I'm now on a research professorship completely, so I've stopped. Um, and in the last course that I gave, while giving the course, I wrote a book. Um, it's going to be published in open access by Oxford University Press, and it's going to be on MIT open access uh, community review, open review uh, within two weeks. And I would love to send you a link, and I would love to get uh, good, proper feedback, like, uh, what are you talking about? I don't understand. This should be nonsense, or blah, blah, blah. Um, very quickly, about the relationship between differential privacy and the GDPR. First of all, the GDPR addresses controllers, not computer scientists, not developers. Developers have no liability, no liability. And I think that's a very good thing because it is whoever puts the stuff on the market or whatever government agency uses it that should be addressed. So first of all, from a very practical perspective, I would say, and many of my practicing lawyer colleagues say, Assume that the data that you are processing is personal data. Maybe it is pseudonymized. Um, and as somebody tweeted this morning, maybe it's anonymized, but it's definitely not going to be anonymous. Maybe for a short while, but the chance that uh, it becomes re-identifiable in this uh, fast-moving environment is very big. So for very practical reasons, just assume that. Make sure you have a valid legal ground. And as you know, there are six valid legal grounds. Consent, contract, vital interests of the data subject, public task or exercise of public authority, a legal obligation, that is a statutory obligation, or the legitimate interest of the data controller that may be an economic interest. But in that case, somebody can object and it may be that the uh, fundamental rights and freedoms and interests of the data subject overrule that legitimate interest. So that ground is complex. It's complicated. The consent ground is a weak ground. If you can do without it, do without it, because there are too many requirements uh, under the GDPR. 
And we've already heard yesterday, one of the requirements is that anybody should be able to withdraw their consent at any moment. That means all the processing operations up to that point are valid, nothing wrong. But from that moment onward, the data should actually be uh, deleted. Um, and what is more beautiful, that withdrawal should be as easy as giving consent. So basically, if you have a website with a button, consent, you should be able to push, no, I withdraw my consent as easily with a button that is as flies as much in your face. That's, that's quite tough, right? Well, then you have to check whether you're processing Article 9 data, and that will often be inferred data. So from four proxies, if you can infer that you are gay, that you are Muslim, what have you, um, uh, then that I there is a basic prohibition and you're only allowed to process if one of the exceptions apply. Uh, that can be consent, but the consent requirement here is even more stringent. Um, and we'll come to the search exception soon. Now, when you aggregate behavioral data, so think social networks, etc., or web surfing behavior, and if you compress the data that you have aggregated, to a target function, or let's say the approximation of an assumed target function. In that case, it's very wise to conduct a data protection impact assessment. And the impact you're assessing is the impact on fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subjects. That's much more than the just checking boxes. And it means it requires a precautionary approach. It's not just some sort of risk assessment where you can say, oh, 90 to 30 percent. It's a precautionary approach. You have to err on the side of caution. Right? Precautionary approach means that you build in uncertainty, which is not the same as risk. The same goes for applying data protection by default. That's data minimization. So here, um, this is a legal obligation. This article, that is article... Um, uh, 25, isn't it? Where are the lawyers here? Okay. 25 or 35, I always mix them up. So there is a legal obligation to build in data protection by default. I think differential privacy in certain cases, if it becomes state of the art and is economically feasible, will be an obligation. So, so here you have your hook. Then you have to check whether you're making... Yes? So again, going back to the uh, discussion before, yeah. is it only to the people that gave the information? Is it uh, for applying the, the data, data machine uh, model? This is always... Um, an, uh, the, the GDPR addresses controllers. So it's the controller that is the entity, legal person or whoever, who determines the purpose of the processing. Again, I'm, I'm I think his question was, okay. in assessing the fundamental rights and freedoms, is it the fundamental rights and freedoms of the people whose data you yeah. have, or the people to whom the model is going to be applied? Mm -hmm. Both, right? of course. Both. Yeah. No, it's about the answer. She, he both. Said, she said both. And, and it is both? both. Yeah, sure. Okay. Did I get the question? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, both. Because they're both data subjects, and in the second case, uh, there is what you now see, the last thing. So if you make automated decisions in the sense of Article 22, that means a decision that is fully automated and that has significant effect, or legal effect, and fully automated as defined by the advisory body, that's the EDPB now, European Data Protection Board, Fully automated means that if you try to do window dressing and you say, oh, but we have a real natural person, you know, this lady is sitting there and she looks into her screen and then the system says you have to make a decision A and then she makes decision A and then we are outside Article 22. The EDPB has said, no, you're not outside 22 because there are two requirements. If such a person disqualifies the automated decision, that person must, one, 
understand how the decision was taken. Well, think machine learning systems, must understand it. And two, must have the competence to take another decision. These are two very heavy requirements. So if you just put somebody there who is um, for window dressing, it will still count as a decision in the sense of Article 22. <coughs> These decisions are prohibited, comma, unless one of three exceptions apply. And that, that is uh, consent, of course, um, contract, and another one, legal obligation, uh, which means there must be member state law uh, with all the relevant safeguards. If one of the exceptions apply, applies, uh, you must be able to obtain human intervention and um, a very specific uh, transparency requirements apply. So you must be told, not just when you ask, but as soon as this system is in operation, you must be told that the decision that was taken about you was an automated decision. You must be told meaningful information about the logic of that system and the envisaged consequences. As you can understand, libraries have already been filled with what that means. Yeah. So I'm going to go very fast. Two minutes, you say, right? It's a three. Yeah. Yeah. Three, well, that's, that's a gift. <laughs> so I made slide 11 of uh, around 30 slides. <laughs> but, but this makes uh, the discussion very interesting. OK, so there is a very broad exception for scientific research. Um, that doesn't mean that if you are under that exception that you do not need a proper legal ground, one of those six, and that if you're processing sensitive data, which also includes inferred data that are sensitive, um, then you will have to have one of the exceptions of Article 9 because that processing is by default prohibited. Um, okay, so differential privacy might contribute to what recital 162 says, the result of processing for statistical purposes, not being personal data, but aggregate data, that might mean that it remains outside of the scope of the GDPR. On one of the last slides, I have article 162, if you're interested in the Q&A, we can have a proper look at it. Uh, transparency requirements are already mentioned. Now the interesting question is how to go back to what I actually wanted to say. So I'm going to skip very quick. Oh, this is a nice one. So um, I, I think this is a cartoon about behaviorism, right? Um, much of the processing of behavioral data is based on, let's say, a particular type of doing social science, which is also very influential in economics. Um, I think that from a scientific perspective, you can have many, many ob um, objections against this type of science. I would dare to profess, and I have written about that, that this is pseudoscience. So if you give a dog a few change choices, and then the dog makes one of those choices, and then you want to draw enormous conclusions about what dogs are like from that particular situation, you are taking people for a ride. Hmm? This has nothing to do with how dogs actually behave. And if you want to know something about that, don't restrain their choice. Of course, this is trying to um, do something with uh, living organisms that works very well in the natural sciences with non-living organisms. Right? We all know it is necessary, and also in mathematics, to say we're going to put some parameters, uh, fix them, because then we can test something else. If you do that with living entities, you get pseudoscience. <coughs> all right, so I'm going to go very fast. Yeah, so, so can I have three more minutes? We did have a lot of discussion. We had a lot of discussion. <laughs> so yes, we may we may be low in discussion at the end if we do that. But okay. So 
about agonistic machine learning, because this, is this I think is important and interesting for you. When you develop a uh, machine learning research design, you're going to do a lot of things, like select the data, curate the data. In the social domain, I'm not even talking about the social sciences yet, but in the social domain, most of the behavioral data are low-hanging fruit. They are just what you can easily grasp. It doesn't mean it's the data you need, not at all. Second, you're going to develop a feature space. You're going to say, okay, these variables I'm going to pick out because I think they're relevant. Here we get all the biases that you can possibly conceive of, like confirmation bias, the survival bias that I introduced in the unbaked ideas, etc. You have to formulate a machine-readable task, otherwise the system can't do anything. That means you have to answer the question what you are asking the algorithm, the learner algorithm, to optimize for. Who is actually deciding that? Then you're going to develop a hypothesis space. Now, some people might think that's objective because it's a computer and because it's mathematics. But I'm sure you understand that this is not objective at all. If you are in a hurry, if you want to constrain the space, there are very many different ways to do this. So um, then you're going to choose performance metric. Imagine if you choose six. Two are above 80%, four are below 50%. You have to get funded, you have to sell the stuff. What do you think you're going to show people? Yes. Out of sample testing, um, uh, well, this is of course about data dredging using the same data set until it gives you the uh, p-value that you want. Uh, there, there is some scientific research now that says that behavioral advertising suffers from enormous p-hacking. It's like nothing but p-hacking uh, because you want to sell stuff, right? Um, and of course, there's always the assumption that the model that you have developed, um, that the distribution of the data that you have not used is the same. If you do not use that assumption, it, it's worth nothing. That assumption is practical in some instances, but not necessarily. Huh? This is something, if you, if you take uh, Tom Mitchell's handbook from the first to the last page, he's warning against that. Um, so I think it's nothing new for computer scientists. The point is there are a lot of trade-offs between speed and accuracy, between overfitting and uh, overgeneralization. And there are all kinds of bugs that creep into the system. Uh, concerning the accuracy of the data, something you, you can have accuracy on the data of 90% and it can be nonsense in real life. I can give you examples if you want during the Q&A, the, the example of the Plunomia research of Rich Caruana of Microsoft Research. Um, of course, the more data you put together, the bigger you aggregate, the more spurious relations you get, and it's not necessarily the case that you can make that distinction. And if, if you're in a hurry, if you're under trade-off, if the incentive structure is an economic one, uh, then you might want to hide the fact that you're talking about exploratory research, about generating hypotheses instead of having confirmed them. And then, of course, we know that some of these patterns are simply artifacts of translations of real life um, things into um, uh, data sets. So, what does agonistic machine learning mean? Bring in domain experts and take the time to comprehend on both sides, of course. The domain experts also have to make that effort. Bring in the people who will suffer the consequences of your application, um, and this will make the output more robust and acceptable. Uh, there is extensive literature both in political theory and in constructive technology assessment that is very important to get other voices in to make your system more um, robust. Wow, this was it. <laughs> All right, so since we folded in the contentious discussion into the talk, um, we'll let Aaron say a few words and then maybe just take one last comment or question afterwards. All right. <laughs>
Yeah, so thank you. I was looking forward to this because I just finished teaching an undergraduate class on uh, computability. We covered countability. I know quite a bit about agnostic learning, so I figured this was <laughs> like the talk for me. What did you say? Agnostic? A agnostic learn. It turns out to be a technical term also. Um, so may I say something? Oh, oh, well, let me agnostic <laughs> is the opposite of agonistic. I ah, very not talk about Perhaps agnostic. Perhaps a typo. So one of the things that I learned during this talk is that words can mean different things. And I think that was actually a, a key point. If I understood the, one of the concerns about differential privacy is that although it has a very precise mathematical definition, um, of course in English the word privacy is overloaded and there's this risk that when you sort of deploy it and you tell people that it is, you know, they don't know what the word differential means and they know what the word privacy means, that it sort of is math washing, yeah, it doesn't cover what they mean by privacy. But I think that's actually a, a feature and not a bug in the sense that once you're very precise about what you mean by differential privacy, by, by some kind of privacy, it is quite easy to now look at it and say, ah, that's not, that's not what I meant by privacy. That's not appropriate in, in my situation. And, and that's good in the sense that, of course, although pri you know, differential privacy is not aiming to cover everything meant by privacy, one of the things that it does is it provides a language for us to precisely um, differentiate different kinds of privacy, different kinds of privacy desiderata. And so I think that the solution is not to um, sort of stop using the word privacy, but to start to be more precise about different kinds of privacy. We've formalized, you know, one very specific kind of privacy called differential privacy, we should, we should identify these other kinds of privacy desiderata and formalize them. You know, something that Adam, uh, the point Adam made earlier in this workshop is that once you start embedding constraints um, into automated decision making, something that you sort of have to do if you want to, to still have automated decision making and, and have it sort of respect various social norms like privacy, you are sort of unavoidably formalizing mathematically what you think those constraints should be and it's sort of whether or not you view it that way, like code is math and that I would posit that it is better to not do so blindly, that, that is you should realize what you're doing and, and think very hard about when you say in a certain context you want privacy, like what that means mathematically. I, I know that there's many people who have thought very hard for a long time about what privacy means, but it, you know, when you're embedding it into code, you have to think about what it means mathematically. And, and I would say differential privacy is a, like a, an example of a success story of doing that in one sort of narrow case. I'd, I'd also say that, um, there are places where perhaps the computational worldview might lead us astray and we want to sort of hew more closely to sort of traditional legal norms. You know, so theoretical computer scientists, myself included, I think sort of are maybe similar to theoretical physicists in a prior era. We think of computation not just as our, you know, vocation but as a, a lens through which to view everything, the whole world. We view everything as computation. And I think that's correct, but that doesn't mean that it's the most useful lens through which to view everything. So in the same way that a physicist might think of everything as ultimately quantum physics, that doesn't mean that starting with a viewpoint of quantum physics is the right way to view psychology. And so although, for example, we know that in general these kinds of inferential privacy harms you talked about that I, that, that, and the differential privacy doesn't protect against, that, um, yeah, that I can learn a fact about the world and from that you know, correlate observable attributes with, uh, of you with something that, I, that you might not want me to know. We know that in general that's like impossible to protect against in the worst case unless we sort of destroy all access to data. Um, but that doesn't like that doesn't mean, I guess, that we should give up on it because it's not a sort of the kind of thing we can achieve in the worst case. It makes sense to think about regulation and, and sort of legal remedies when people do these things. And so I would say that like when it comes to code, when it comes to sort of 
embedding in algorithms um, directly norms of privacy, we have to, you know, it, we unavoidably have to think mathematically and, and we, you know, differential privacy is the beyond differential privacy workshop. We should think of this as sort of the one building block in what will eventually be a larger sort of edifice, a larger categorization of different kinds of privacy. Um, but for, for, for kinds of privacy that are, that are sort of not possible to promise at a technical level in the worst case, of course, there's still a, you know, th this is sort of exactly the place where, where traditional legal remedies are, are useful. And I'll leave that And maybe we can take at least one question despite the um, constraints. So, um, I want to say that in terms of content, actually, there is, I think, less controversy here, and uh, we are more in agreement. I think that many of us, if you wake up as up in the middle of the night, will say that privacy and fairness and all of those don't have a single definition, and uh, so all we just say go away. Uh, but uh, one of the, the two. And also, I think the first talk in this workshop talked about exactly some of the, of the worries that you are, you are raising. I think what somewhat different is that we feel that computer science has a lot of uh, uh, success in modeling part of problems, even that have to do with humans, and making progress on them, and this progress is still meaningful, even if it's partial. And our view is that if not for differential privacy, it's not that personalization or targeting wouldn't happen, it's just that it would happen, and also the other harms uh, would happen as well. Um, and finally, I think that um, the difference so between the two issues that we talked about, and the, the protecting the data of people within a data set, and the targeting, the difference is much more in the world of incentives and in the world of legal uh, constraints than in the world of process and in the world of, of our math. So in, 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 just, just to explain uh, kind of my thought for, in, in the following sense, for some reason, through this magic of differential privacy, we, sh we showed that you can do what they want to do anyway, which is to learn models, uh, machine learning models, without sacrificing the data of people within the data set. On the other hand, if you want to target individuals when you want to show them ads or to do any of the other things you want to do, we can show that you cannot do exactly what you want to do. You have to sacrifice something. So the problem is in incentives and in telling them, no, you cannot do everything you want to do. Because now there is no CS magic or math magic that can help you do exactly what you want to do uh, without sacrificing data. Because what you want to do is exactly to target and to sacrifice. And so it doesn't matter if uh, computers, all computer scientists will be educated in, in society and computation and we go to the world and uh, knowing all of that and, and and differential privacy will say again and again and again that it doesn't do the other things. If we don't manage to tame the incentives uh, uh, that, that companies have to abuse the data, nothing would help. But I don't have to agree that it doesn't matter. It, it matters enormously that uh, computer scientists realize what can be done with what they have worked out. And I think this shows that you cannot solve these problems by means of formalization, because you have to agree on the task. And, and that makes all the difference. And this is, and that task has to be then translated into machine readable uh, stuff. So there you get the formalization in. But the an engineer or a computer scientist that says, oh, but that's, n that, that's just the economic inf in incentive structure, that you shouldn't do that that's because what, your knowledge is so important. That's what we're saying. We're saying that this process, the question is who's doing this process? Yeah. Who's this entity that's doing this process? Yes. What's the incentives yeah. of this entity? That's, that's what agonistic machine learning is about. Yeah. Right. That's but, what I'm saying. So we totally agree, actually, right? Yeah, I think there is much more agreement uh, mm -hmm. than, than disagreement. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I think <coughs> so probably too. some of the things that people were upset of 
is this assumption that there is a disagreement. <laughs> uh, it kind of made us, uh, that's what we're saying all the time, why are you telling us that we're not doing that? Well, I think there are some disagreements, maybe not with everybody, but uh, my, when I give this sort of talks to audiences, then the doctors in the audience or even the lawyers or the whatever, they, they begin to look in, increasingly angry at me because you can see them think you're taking our toy away. Huh? They just discovered this. The data scientists in the audience, they look at me like, oh, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. and, and this is... Um, the machine learning people, when they gave this, uh, sorry, the, the French and privacy people, when they gave their talks, they were getting the same upset yeah, 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 from yeah. the same doctors that yeah. are worried yeah. that we won't yeah. we'll stop curing the diseases. So we're on the same side, right? So can I just one word say about this? I think we are on the same side and we share a lot of, I mean, we are here because we share a lot of Absolutely. common goals. Yeah. What triggered me, maybe a little too strongly, was the worry that the presentation assigning many faults to a specific uh, uh, technology that I think it's on your side, really. I think it's exactly doing what you wanted. Not everything you want, but where it applies, it's exactly doing what you want. I think this is this is problematic because for audiences that don't understand differential privacy, this looks like a, a, a very good way to justify why we are ignoring or we want to kill this. Uh, yeah, I think the opposite. And unfortunately, I, I understand that you think the opposite, but the way it was presented, uh, went through this way, and I think for many audiences it will go this way. As there are a lot of criticism on differential privacy, which is not uh, the right criticism. We have a lot of criticism on differential privacy, which is the right criticism. Many of us are proving uh, impossibility results about differential privacy. We're, we're doing that as part of. You have to face part. the criticism of people outside your own interpretive community. That's. If, if you don't do that, people but, are not but going but to. The interpretation listen. should at least be correct and fair. Yes. Okay. All right, I, I think I, we should. But okay. the state has been waiting. Yeah, yeah so. Well, um, <laughs> gosh, I, I'm so sorry. I know, but like, we have had this amazing week together, and I feel like it's not just about this talk, but it's like kind of concluding uh, something that's going on. Because also, Aloni did a uh, talk yesterday that was very much around this. And, you know, I'm, we're both involved with ACM FAT, and there's like a huge contestation of you know, what Aaron put very nicely, if we're using similar terms and we're trying to differentiate them and there's something going on there. Um, and I, like for me, um, you know, coming from privacy, like we had the same problem with anonymous communications. If you, if you remember that discussion, people thought they're anonymous, so they did all sorts of things that revealed who they were. Like this was like on the individual level, right? Like um, people in research started using privacy as a term when they actually meant security or secrecy or confidentiality, so that was a terrible thing to do, but they did that in many papers. Then there were companies that said we have privacy solutions and that way got people's data and sold it. So like there's all these ways in which these terms, um, 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 oh yeah, and then it's really important, some of these technologies, and I think that's part of what Mireille is trying to say, say we're enabling privacy while enabling technologies that intrude upon privacy, right? And that's where things get really quirky. Um, and then there's, on top of that, I think with fairness, we have people saying, you know, what it means to be fair and reach justice is something that communities have been thinking out about a lot, and the ahistorical approach is like kind of breaking that, so there's even those tensions. Um, so I feel like we're in the midst of something that is affecting all of our communities very deeply. And I want to take this not as a kind of like, you know, I, I understand like if you've been working on differential privacy and you can look at this talk, and many cryptographers and uh, anonymous communications people feel like that too. Oh, you enable child porn. And you know, like, oh, I've been working on this for 30 years and it's really important we have this, right? Like, this thing is the emotional part and I want to really respect that, it's hard. But I also think that this divergence in vocabulary is not just a vocabulary issue, it's a power issue and it's like an effect issue of what we're doing and how it's affecting the world, right? Uh, and I wonder how we can systematize this conversation rather than seeing it just as a tension. Does that, does that help, maybe? Anyway, going I think, forward. I think we have to wrap up the conversation over coffee. We will resume at 11 o'clock.